Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we're in Esther chapter 4. We're starting verse 1 this lesson. But before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. The number one enemy to man's happiness is man himself because of the evil that resides within him. Even more so, God's people, because they have an enemy bent on destroying them, can experience a measure of mourning. Do we mourn for our brothers and sisters worldwide that are experiencing great persecution and suffering? They're a part of our family. You know, I was thinking several weeks ago, every single day, every single day, there are, we have brothers and sisters around the world, brothers and sisters in the Lord, who are going to be killed today because they believe in the Lord, because they, they put their trust in, in the Word of God and in Jesus Christ as their, as their Savior. Today, some of our brothers and sisters are going to be killed. And tomorrow, there's going to be more of our brothers and sisters killed. And then the next day, and the next day, and every single day, somewhere in this world, uh, there are, we, have, we have family members that are going to be killed for the cause of Christ. And we need to understand that, that, that suffering is, we are called unto sufferings. We are called unto persecutions as Christians. And we need to realize that, that, that we do have family members on the other side of the world, all around the world, and they're, and they're suffering uh, tremendously. Some of them are hiding, some of them are Maybe they're not being killed, but they're experiencing persecution more severe than others. And uh, we need to keep them in prayer. Always remember, today, today, brothers and sisters in the Lord will be killed today. Now, verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. Well, actually, the setting is that the decree has gone out. The letters have been written and now the the the, the uh, well the transporters they're they're on their horses and donkeys and whatever going out to these provinces delivering these letters to the to the different provinces that on the thirteenth day of the twelfth month uh, they are to kill the Jews all right to uh, kill them and wipe them out from of the of the kingdom. Verse 1 of chapter 4 says, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Mordecai, and in verse 1, Mordecai goes out into the midst of the city, not caring what people thought, and maybe also to awaken people to what it's like to have a price put on your head. In verse, in verse 2, it says, Then he comes before the king's gate, maybe to let his feelings be heard by the leaders, and also maybe so that Esther would find out and would be able to help in some way. Solomon tells us that a life of continuous pleasures and happiness here on earth is not what is best for our souls. Let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. And it says here, 
A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of one's death than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, and by the sadness of the countenance the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. Now, in verse 2 here of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, those around us will take it to heart that life on earth is not all fun and games. Because of the curse of sin, there is great sorrow also. Our rejoicing should never be in this world, but our rejoicing should be in the Lord and in God's salvation and in the shadow of God's wing. Rejoice because you are clothed with the righteousness of God, right? When, when, they, when, when the disciples said to Jesus, you know, boy, we went out and did miracles and did this and that. And even the demons were subject to us. And Jesus said, what, rejoice? Why? Not, don't rejoice in the fact that you cast demons out and you had all this power. Don't get puffed up. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Rejoice that your names are simply written in heaven. That's what you should rejoice in. Don't rejoice in all the wonderful things, you know, you've done here on earth or God did through you or how many ministries or how many souls were saved. Don't rejoice in that. Rejoice that you escaped a lake of fire forever and ever and ever. the eternal the eternal punishment of God against you, against a, a, against a Christ-rejecting person. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Not once do we see Mordecai ever consider going back on his faith to change the situation. Listen, never go back on your faith to try to fix something. You may never come back. If you do, you may never come back to the Lord. And those whom you are trying to help may never come to the Lord. A watered down faith does no one any good. There, there's no benefit whatsoever for, from a watered-down faith in the Lord. And then it says in verse 2, For none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Some people close their eyes to the sorrows and sickness of others. Right? The king would not allow anyone into the, his gates that had sackcloth on. Sackcloth represented sorrow and sadness. The king wouldn't allow it in his kingdom. I'm sorry, in his, in his courts, right? So some people choose to close their eyes to the sorrows and to the sickness of others. They only want happiness and fun things in their life. Yet, this is a form of escape from reality. Yet our Lord is a man of sorrows and he's acquainted with grief. Our Lord can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. The king didn't want to be touched with, with the feelings of anybody's infirmities and problems and sicknesses. But Jesus does. And then verse 3, And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decrees came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, 
and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. If there were any half-hearted Jews towards God and his word, it was, it was now gone because the seriousness of their situation in Isaiah 55 and verse 6, it says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. And you can bet if there were any half-hearted Jews towards God at this time, they weren't half-hearted anymore. <laughs> they woke up. They woke up. They were seeking the Lord, right? Seek ye the Lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he is near. They were calling. You can bet they were calling upon God. Now, verses 4 through 14 deal with, deal with Mordecai has a plan. Mordecai has a plan. All right. So let's start in verse 4. We're going to do verses 4 through 6 in this lesson. So he says here, So Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it to her. Then was the queen <clears throat> exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him. But he received it not. All right, so in verse 4, so far, it doesn't seem that Esther knows why Mordecai is doing this, because Mordecai he, because Mordecai explains why in verses 7 and 8. So Esther is in, she's in the house. She's the queen now. She's in the king's house. And she hears that Mordecai is out and he's weeping and wailing and he's clothed in sackcloth. And now she wants, she, she sends clothes out, but she doesn't know why. She doesn't know why yet. It is possible it is possible that those attending Esther do know of her relationship with Mordecai, but the king still doesn't know. So, although, uh, remember, remember when, when Esther was brought as a virgin to the, to the king's palace, and she was given what? She was given seven maids, right? Uh, as uh, as uh, coming into the as a virgin uh, coming into the king's uh, palace here. And uh, so she was given seven maidens. Now, we don't know. By now, she's the queen. Who knows? Maybe she's got 20 maidens or something. We don't know. But it seems that, that it's possible that these maidens knew the relationship between Mordecai and Esther. But for sure, again, it's not proven that it is. We don't know. But for sure, the king, he doesn't know. The king doesn't know anything about the relationship between Esther and Mordecai, all right? And it says here that she sent raiment to Mordecai. So she, she hears about it. She gives, she gives some raiment to somebody to send out to Mordecai to clothe him, all right? Now, Esther may have wanted Mordecai to change his clothes so that he could come into the king's gate so that she could talk with him to find out why he's doing this. So when she sends the clothes out, it's possible one of the reasons is because she wants Mordecai to come into the king's gate and explain what's going on. But Mordecai was too grief-stricken, and he would not be comforted. Mordecai would not be comforted, even by Esther's Esther's, um, how can I say, uh, act of, uh, of, of help, all right, uh, her, uh, her benevolence or whatever towards, towards him to give him these clothes. Now, verses 5 and 6, it says, Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed, I'm sorry, who, yeah, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which was before the king's gate. So now we have Hatak involved here. 
other, now listen to this, other than Haman, who had a house outside of the confines of the king's house. In chapter 5, in verse 10, Haman goes home. Haman doesn't live in the king's house like Esther does, all right, like, like um, Haggai does and like Hatak does. They don't, he, Haman doesn't live in the king's house. He leaves the king's palace every day and he goes home, all right? So other than Haman, who had a house outside of the confines of the king's house, Hatak, Hatak is the only other person who's mentioned that left the king's house or left the king's gate. So the only two people that are mentioned so far that actually leave the king's house and goes out to the public is Haman and Hatak. All those that are inside the king's gates or inside the king's house, including the king and Haman, who knew what was going on, had no idea what was, what was decreed. And the turmoil in Shushan and the rest of the province. So except for, except for the king and except for Haman, no one else in the king's house knew what was going on. They were all isolated from reality. All the virgins and concubines and, 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 and Queen Esther, they were all they were all inside the kings. They were isolated from what, what was going on out in the real world out there. You know, sometimes, sometimes Christians can isolate themselves from reality because of all the bad things that are going on in the world. They look around the world and they see all the terrible things happening, going on and say, I just want to, I just want to escape from reality. I don't like this anymore. I want to do my own thing and hibernate, go into a cave, right? Stick my head in the, in the sand and, and just have a happy life all by myself. I'm not saying that Christians should get, should get stressed out over, uh, over, uh, over the overburdened things with what's going on in, in our, in our world, but Christians should be informed. All right, Christians should be informed as to what's going on. I'm not saying you have to watch the news for five hours a day in order to get a well-rounded picture of what's going on. No, because sometimes you you know you watch the news, you get all get all bent out of shape because of what's going on in the world. You get all upset and 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 it brings stress in. But it is good for Christians to know basically what's going on in the world. And if, you, and if you have a leading by God, you can go even much deeper and get into politics and get into world, world events and all those kinds of things. But some, some Christians can't take it so well. So they, 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 they but, it, but still, that's not an excuse for not knowing what's generally happening on, going on in the world. Every Christian should be informed. You shouldn't just say, well, the world's terrible. I'm going to, I'm going to escape from the world. I'm going to, you know, what a, build a house in the woods and never have TV and radio or anything. Never have anything to do with anybody else, right? <laughs> Except for if I go to the store. <laughs> but it, that's not good for, for, for Christians. We need to, to, to be, to be knowledgeable of what's going on in this world. All right. We're going to start verse seven, uh, next lesson. But until then, Walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.